All right, well, we're going to continue our series in growth. Hopefully, y'all are looking forward to growing this year. Hopefully, you've been growing this year. How many of y'all been growing this year? Not outwardly. Outwardly. How many of y'all been growing outwardly? How many of you put on a few pounds? Max? All right. I just wanted to see who's being honest. Who else? Anybody else been putting on a few pounds this year? I, I, I put on a few pounds. I see some women raising their hands, so I'm not going to comment about anything about that. I'll just stay in the safe zone. But uh, we do want to grow this year, don't we? We want to, we want to grow. We want to increase. And uh, such is our theme this year. We've been looking at uh, all of these biblical personalities, these people in the Bible, and we've been trying to figure out how in the world we can learn from what they did. What we can replicate that's positive and what we can stay away from that's negative, right? And uh, we can look at people and say, that's a good example, and replicate it and look at people and say, that's a bad example. We're going to stay away from that. And so last week, we looked at, we looked at David, David part one, we looked at some of the things that he shouldn't have done that he did. And uh, it's quite a shame, really, he had uh, such great potential, even from a youth, which we're going to look at this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open it to 1 Samuel 16, 1 Samuel 16, and we're going to talk about growth in the life of King David. Growth is most obvious when you're doing the things that uh, you've been called to do. Uh, there are times we, we do things that maybe we're not called to do. Growth is less obvious. If you are called to be a car salesman and you are a car mechanic, you're only going to grow so far. Nothing wrong with being a car salesman or a car mechanic. If you're called to be a car mechanic and you're a car salesman, you're not doing what it is you've been called to do. Your growth won't be as significant. So the goal is, is to kind of hit that stride, right? is to find that, uh, that mojo, that, that middle road, get in the zone. This is what God has called me to do. Do what you're destined to do. You may have heard people say uh, that if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? Love what you do. Can I say this? I'm not so sure about that. I would say that if you're doing what you're called to do, you may work and never feel like you're working a day in your life, right? So do what it is you've been called to do. And I tell you what, if you're doing what you're called to do, you'll love it. You'll love it. How many of y'all have done things in your life that uh, maybe you didn't, you, you didn't feel called to or you didn't like doing? How many of you cleaned a septic tank in your life? Anybody? Max, he's got his hand up. All right. You've cleaned a septic tank. All right. So if you have any questions about the inner workings of a septic tank, Phil's your man. <laughs> Phil and Max, right? And uh, how, many of you have, uh, how many of you have done other things? There's a, there's a, there's a show on TV. And, uh, and I do not endorse this. I, I, I don't know much about it. I saw it one time. I, I, I don't know much about who Mike Rowe is, but he does this uh, thing. He, it's, a, it's a TV show called Dirty Jobs. How many of y'all heard of that? Okay, so you saw a lot of you. How many of you have watched it? How many of you are a fan of it? Come on. Okay, all right. I don't know, I don't know much about it. I, I do know that the one episode I watched, it was really kind of hysterical. He was, he was examining a, a, a tower of some sort. And he climbed into this tower, and, and the man door was only about, I don't know, that, that big. Only men can be in there, because it's a man door, so no women allowed. And so it's a little door, and he climbs in it, and he's got this, he must have a GoPro or something. And he, he, was, he was climbing up this thing, and he kept on saying, you know, wow, this keeps getting tighter. And, and bef when he got to the top of that thing, he was kind of like this, and he was looking over at the camera, and it's just one of those jobs that he probably didn't want to do. And it's a dirty job, but somebody what? Yeah, Stuart, you all know that, right? Okay. But the reality is, is we need to do what it is we're called to do, and we're going to see the greatest growth in our lives. So this morning, we're going to look at two aspects of David's career as king. Two aspects of David's career as king. First of all, I want you to note that, I want you to note David's calling. David's calling. Uh, David was called to be the king. He was anointed by Samuel the prophet to be the king of Israel. I'm going to read a few verses here, and then I want to give you two quick thoughts. First of all, beginning in 1 Samuel 16, beginning in verse 6. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Let me stop there and give you a little background. First of all, uh, there was a transition in power. Saul was going to be booted. And there needed to be a new king. 
So Samuel the prophet was told of God to go to Jesse's house, and there he'll find his king. So Jesse, had uh, his quiver was full. He, he, had a, uh, he had a lot of kids. And so uh, the kids kind of line up before him. And Samuel the prophet looks upon this person, Eliab, and said, Surely this is the one. This is going to be the king of Israel. In verse 7, he says this, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. This was not the guy. He's not the one. Eliab was not the one. In verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema, to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. In verse 10, again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. <laughs> now you can just imagine uh, uh, you know, Samuel. I mean, I, I, I kind of like to put myself in the context of what Samuel was doing. Here he is. Come on, Lord. You, you sent me all the way over here to pick up this guy that's supposed to be king, Jesse marches out seven of these guys, and not one of them? Not one of these guys is going to do? Surely this guy, is, he's got some stature. This guy looks like Saul. This guy is a, is a buff guy right here. Big, tall, strapping young man. But not one of these guys. So Samuel says to Jesse in verse 11, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Descend and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Almost awaiting the king. We're all going to stand and we're going to wait. Because if God sent me to choose the king, to anoint the king of Israel, he's got to be here somewhere. Two things I want to point out just real quickly. First of all, David was called to be king when others thought differently. Samuel thought in verse 6 that Eliab was to be the king. Now Jesse didn't even consider David until the very, very last person. Kind of ran its whole course, you know, not this one, not that one, not this one. It's like, I don't know, you ever play, uh, you ever, you ever play dodgeball in high school? And, uh, or, or, or you play teams? First of all, dodgeball, they don't play it the way they, they used to play it. They have these these balls that you throw, they're hard, but they don't have any impact. When I was a kid, we took these balls, they were rubber. And you get hit in the side of the head with one of those, you end up like me. I'm telling you, it hurts. Yeah, you see, I mean, you don't, you don't want, uh, you, you hide behind, you, that's where cheating started, is in that game because the dodgeballs were so, so hard. Anyway, I digress. So here it is, you've got this, uh, none of these guys. Samuel didn't think that, that the very last one would be the one. Jesse certainly didn't think that Dave would be the one. He was kind of the, 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 the last, the last uh, person you pick for a team. I guess I'll take Phil. <laughs> I guess I'll take Phil, right? I mean, Phil, he's, he's a body, he'll be there. Ironically, though, the Bible says that the last will be first. The first will be last. In Mark 10, 28 to 31, it says, And Peter began to say unto him, Lord, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's sake. Now that's a shame. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and the world to come eternal life, but many that are first shall be last and the last first. It's amazing. I think God was playing this out. It's not this one. It's not that one. And we're going to burn through five other brothers before we get to the guy that really is meant to be the king of Israel. 
It is amazing to me the choice that was made. I think the thing that strikes me the most comes from verse 7, though. Look at verse 7. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. Don't look on the outside to determine what's on the inside. We've all heard this before. Don't judge a book by its cover. Don't you look on the outside to determine what's on the inside. Because that is what man does. They look on the outside. But God says, I look on the inside. I want to know what the heart of the matter is. We all look on our outside to determine whether or not we're capable of accomplishing the tasks that God has asked us to accomplish. I wonder what ran through David's mind. Well, I mean, I wonder what ran through Jesse's mind and, and Samuel's mind and his seven brothers' mind. This can't possibly be the next king. Oh. But God may see it differently. I tell you what, friends, when we're challenged this year specifically to grow, our agenda this year, our theme is Growth 2020. And we look at ourselves and we say, but Lord, I can't possibly grow. How many of us have pointed to other people and said, that person, it can't possibly be the person you've called to do the task you want them to do? We have to look what's on the inside. What's deep inside. This is what God does. Secondly, first of all, as I mentioned that David was called to be a king when others thought differently. Secondly, David was called to be a king while he was busy doing other things. My friends, I think this is important. Don't wait around until one day you find what your calling is. Does that mean you don't look for your calling? No, I don't think that that's what that means. I said just don't wait around doing nothing. Be busy about the business that God has called you to do in that very, very moment. When you look at verse 11, it says this, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. I suppose that there is this one guy right now, and he's not lined up with the seven brothers. He's out doing what it is that a, a shepherd is supposed to be doing. He's tending the flock. He's out there busy about the business that God has instructed him to do. He was busy. He wasn't sitting around waiting for someone to call him to be king. When you are busy in the little things that you're supposed to do, God will give you much bigger things. It's amazing how many people want to have a position in an organization, in a church. They have uh, a desire to be somebody, but they won't do something so small as clean the toilets. But clean the toilets. How many people, how many of you know people who clean the toilets with gladness? Pretty much everybody cleans the toilets with sadness. But not many people clean the toilets with gladness. Sometimes it's doing the small things that God has called you to do so that maybe one day he'll call you to be king. David was busy with his, busy with his sheep. It's amazing we all want the results of growth, but nobody wants the resolve to grow. They don't want to do the things necessary. It's been said that everybody wants to harvest, but nobody wants to plow. What's interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is the blended result that is, is, is achieved when you do the things maybe that uh, are, are, are less delightful. In 1 Corinthians 3, 8, 9, it says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. You're going to receive your own reward according to your own labor. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. We labor together with God. Now that's an amazing thing. Whether you plow, whether you plant, 
or whether you pluck up that which is planted, right? Whether, whether you're out harvesting the fields or not, we are laborers together. I, I kind of look back at this, this example of, uh, of picking the, the, the king of Israel. I, you wonder what had to go through the minds of the brothers. You know, what, what went through their minds as they, as they waited and waited and waited, and then they stood waiting for, uh, under Samuel's direction, we're going to stand here and wait for the youngest brother. You wonder what went through their mind. Did they look at themselves as, as part of the, a bigger plan, or like, we've been, we've been passed over here? Are, are, are we passed over? Do we not receive a, a, a benefit of being the brother of, the, a, of a king? Or, or, you, or you wonder, boy, look, how did, how did the youngest guy get? Look at the, the, the youngest. He's young and small. We're looking for bigger. You know, it's, it's interesting. When, when, I, when, I think of, when I think of growth and the potential, the potential to grow this year, I think it, it really begins by you looking on the inside and getting it in the gut. And saying, you know what, I, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to grow. And, and, and even though everything else around us is shrinking, your jobs are shrinking, the economy is shrinking, everybody, the health, every, every, there's so many concerns out there. How can I possibly grow? I'm just, I'm just, not, the, I'm just not a growth type person. We talk about this from time to time, people who don't have a growth mindset. And, and I have to say, listen, friends, if God has called us to grow, and we are not growing. We are in disobedience to God. Let me ask you a real targeted question. Can God bless disobedience? He can't, can he? So if you're not doing what God told you to do, you're, disobedient, you're, being, you're disobeying God. Do you think you're going to get the blessings that other people... I mean, th this, is, this, is, this is David. He's out in the field and he's, just, he's, he's watching over the sheep. And he got blessed. David had a heart for taking care of what was entrusted to him. He had a heart for taking care of what was entrusted to him. How many of us don't take care of what, what's entrusted to us? Was this the heart that God was looking for in his king? Was, was God looking for this specific Thing in, in, in a king. I want my king to be busy. I want my king to be taking care of his sheep. Because if you can't take care of your sheep in a pasture, how are you going to take care of your sheep in a palace? I want my king out there doing the work that I've called him to do. And maybe this is why David was a man after God's own heart, a shepherding heart. Are you faithful in the little things, friends? Are you faithful in the things that God has called you to do? And I'm not saying this just to get you faithful to do the little things that I wouldn't do, because let me tell you, friends, before any of y'all were here, I was cleaning the toilets of this building. It was me. And after me, it was my kids. My kids have cleaned more toilets in this building than you. And they were faithful in little things. And they still do those things. Rebecca's been here five years. You know who cleaned the toilets yesterday? It was Rebecca. The reason you have a clean toilet today is because Rebecca is faithful in the small things. And that's why I'm going to anoint her king. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> have a heart. Have a heart for doing the things that God has called you to do. So first of all, that was his calling. Secondly, I want to look at David's confidence. David's confidence. Now, now, David's confidence grew out of an experiential knowledge of God. He knew God. And, and, and friends, there is a difference between knowing about God and knowing God, and David knew God experientially. David knew that God came through for him in the past. 
Do you remember how many times God has come through for you in the past? Do you, uh, do you count your blessings and name them one by one? Do you, do you look to God's faithfulness and say, God has been faithful here, and he's been faithful here, and he's been faithful here, and he's been faithful here. This is exactly what David did. Just before David killed the giant Philistine Goliath, you know what he said to Saul and, and, and those around him? Here's what he said in 1 Samuel 17, verse 37. Remember, nobody was willing to challenge Goliath. Everybody was afraid of him. And so what they were going to do is they were going to suit David up with a bunch of armor and a sword and say, run out there and go battle this massive giant. And he says, no. And they all thought he was suicidal. This is uh, the first kamikaze right here. I'm going to run into battle, and I'm going to pick up some stones and take my sling with me. 1 Samuel 17, 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. God has been faithful before. Why wouldn't he be faithful again? God has always come through. He always will come through, or else he's a liar. So oftentimes we question, is it possible that God is going to really come through this time? David had no question whether or not God was going to be faithful. David had this confidence that I am doing exactly what God wants me to do, and because of that, God is going to protect me all the way. How remarkable is that? Have you ever had that confidence before in your life when, when, when you have chosen to do something that maybe others would, would think is kamikaze? It's insane. This, this doesn't make any sense, David. We're, 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 we, have, we, have, we have swords, and, and we've got all this armor I mean, certainly there's, there's something, you know, more intelligent here. You know, you're just, a, you're just a little boy. It's a good little boy. It's a good boy. Don't tend sheep. That, that guy's a big guy. But God delivered me before. Why wouldn't he deliver me again? Why wouldn't God be faithful like he's always been faithful? I tell you what, when we... When we count our blessings, name them one by one, when we're, when we're looking at God's track record for faithfulness, he never fails. He never wavers. He's always faithful. David had this confidence, and there's a lot of Christians who put their confidence in things that are not God. They put their confidence in vaccines. They put their confidence in a, a mask. They put their confidence in a, in a level of, of social distancing. They put their confidence essentially in, in themselves and in other people, right? And the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 26, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust your own ways. Don't lean on your own understanding. In Psalm 118, 6 to 9, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. The Lord taketh my part with me that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Why do we trust? Why do we, why do we put our confidence in, 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 a, in an individual? I'm not saying don't, don't trust them on an on a, on a earthly level. I mean, we, we trust people. I trust you guys. I, trust, I trusted you all this morning enough to come in here. We're in Iowa. We're gun-toting Iowans. Any one of you could shoot me right now. And I trusted you. You trusted me that I'm not going to preach more than 20 minutes late. <laughs> See the level of trust there? <laughs> and if I do, I don't trust you anymore because you're probably going to shoot me. And we need to trust people. We trust people. I trust Lydia. I trust, don't trust Andy. I trust Donna. 
Where do we put our confidence, though? Do, we put our con- do I put my confidence in Liddy or, or Andy or Don or any of you? No. Put my confidence in God. David had tremendous confidence that he was doing exactly what it was God wanted him to do. And you know, because he had that confidence, he won. For the vast majority of, of David's life, he was a winner. This guy, he, he, he won. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't lose. You don't lose when you're King David. When you trust God, you win. And you win a lot. I wonder if David ever got sick of winning. I know he wasn't faithful when he kept on winning, and we looked at last week when he stayed back in Jerusalem when kings were, about, when kings were supposed to be out in battle. He, he didn't do what he should have done. And in that case, he didn't do what God called him to do. In this case, he did very much what God called him to do. I tell you what, if you want to grow this year, if you want to grow at all in your life, if you want to grow in your finances, if you want to grow in your marriage, if you want to grow in your home, if you want to grow your company, if you want to grow in any area, you have to trust God. It's just not good enough to trust yourself. If you trust in your own heart, you're a fool. You're a fool. People who say, well, I can do this. I can. I'm the kind of guy who pulls himself up by his bootstraps. You ever try that? It doesn't work. You can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's somebody who says, I will trust in God. This is my calling, and because I'm pursuing my calling, this is my confidence. People say, well, that's, that's blind confidence. No, 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 no. No, it's trusting. It's trusting God that he's going to come through like he said he would. Let me just say this real quickly in conclusion, that God doesn't want you to fail in the Christian life. If God has called you to grow, he's going to give you every means by which necessary to grow. Sometimes you've got to grow in the small things too. Sometimes it's shepherding the sheep on a small level. Sometimes you just got to do those little things necessary all the time, just the little itty bitty things. You got to get up. You got to get out of bed. You got to make your bed. You got to make your bed. Isn't that right, honey? You got to make your bed. Isn't that right, kids? Yeah, got to make your bed. You got to do the small things. And then at times, then God will say, because you've been faithful in a little, I'm going to give you a lot to be faithful over. Because you were faithful in the fields with your sheep, I'll give you the palace. If you want to grow, you've got to be faithful. It starts with pursuing your calling. And when you have your calling, you'll have tremendous confidence. We've got to trust in God. It's amazing we trust in God for salvation. We trust in God for salvation. I believe that when I die, I will spend an eternity with him. My confidence is not in me. It's not in what I can do. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. He did it. I'm putting my confidence in him. I'm trusting that he saved me from my sin, that I can't save myself from my sin. The wages, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die for you. He died on the cross for you, for me. And then we receive eternal life by putting our trust, our confidence in that payment. Isn't that wonderful? I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want my wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that we all have sin. The Bible says that this payment for sin is death. Someone has to die. The wages of sin is not turning over a new leaf. The wages of sin is not water baptism. The wages of sin is not church membership or walking an aisle or praying a prayer, giving money. That's not the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross to make the payment for our sin. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Not by works of goodness, 
not by the good things we've done, but by the good thing he's done, by his mercy, his mercy he saves us. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. How are you saved? It's simply by when we trust that Jesus' payment was sufficient for us, that he's the son of God, that he died on the cross, was buried, and he rose again the third day. Because if he didn't come back from the grave, he's not God, and he's still dead. He had to, there had to be a resurrection. He had to come back. His shed blood is how we have eternal life. It's when we put our confidence in him. Now, if you want to grow in the Christian life, you've got to be a Christian. That's becoming a Christian. It's when you make the decision in the quietness of your own mind, the best in all, I believe Jesus died for me. That's becoming a Christian. That's where growth starts. As a matter of fact, in, uh, in the Gospel of John chapter 3, it's called the new birth. It's the new birth. That's, isn't that where growth begins? When you're born? If you haven't done that, if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, I beg of you that you do that today. I pray nobody leaves this building without knowing whether or not they're saved. 